Hi, this is Marie Wallace, here in New York, appearing in an American Renaissance Theatre Company production of Winterworks 2018, Look Me in the Eyes. And I'm talking with Rabbi Saul Solomon on the Dave's Gone By show on UNC Radio. Oh, shalom, my friends. This is your old buddy, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder Ooh. of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York, and spiritual leader. <laughs> well, so great to talk to you, sir, Rabbi. Oh, Always a pleasure. That joyous voice on the other end of the line is an actress, someone who has been doing Broadway and off-Broadway and regional theater for a few decades now, and she's still back on stage. You can go see her in a one-act play over uh, from the American Renaissance Theatre Company. They're doing it at the Director's Company on West 43rd Street. She'll tell you all about it, but she'll also tell us about when she was in the original Gypsy, and when she was in Sweet Charity, and the amazing people that she worked with, and I don't know why I'm talking like this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the neighborhood, Marie Wallace. Shalom, Marie. Shalom. So good to be here. Thank you oh, you're for so... inviting me. Oh, anytime, anytime, a million times, because we are delighted to talk to someone who has so much background in the theater. And I didn't even mention that she was a shadowy figure because she was in the TV show Dark Shadows, and we'll talk about that too. So welcome again. Welcome, welcome. I'm so happy to be welcomed. Thank you. The only bad part is, the only negative part is that you yourself are not Jewish. However, oh, no, but I was married to a Jewish man. Does that count? Oh, it, it almost does. You're Jewish by injection, as it were. So, okay, and, 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 here's a, here's a fun uh, little uh, note. I worked at the, temp the Actors' Temple in New York with Larry Storch. We did uh, Love Letters a couple of years ago. Larry Storch from F Troop. How is he? How we this is a couple it, of years ago, but how was he? Larry Storch is wonderful. We had originally worked up in the Hampton Playhouse, uh, I think, between uh, shows from the Dark Shadows. You know, I kept playing uh, many parts, so when I finished one part, I'd go off and do Summer Sock, and that year, I worked with Larry, and he was just a delight, and we've been friends ever since, and I was at his 95th birthday the other night. Oh, my muscle, I did, I didn't realize, I was, I, is he in physical, decent, okay condition for a 95? He is, and he has the wonder of a young man. When the, the, we had the most wonderful uh, gr music group, we had wonderful actresses. Uh, Barbara Feldon came with a, um, a wonderful birthday cake. It was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, celebration. Oh, oh, I'm so happy to hear this, and that you worked on that play. Love Letters, by the way, for people who do not know, is in a is an epistolary play, uh, because, you know, it's, it's hog as a pistol. No, I'm kidding. It, <laughs> that was terrible. But it has to do with, you, the nice thing is you don't have to memorize. You can, you can read the play because they're reading letters to each other, the characters are. So you don't have to memorize, it's there in front of you. It's an interesting way of doing things, isn't it? You know, it worked great. It, it, it's really fun, and, and you really can get into it. And um, those letters, I mean, it's beautifully written, so it, it was great. You are, yeah, I'm not going to say what age you are, but I think you're in the 70-something range. Am I correct on that? I might be, I might be. Possibly. So is it tougher to memorize for you now than it used to be? Or, nah, it's just, it is what it is. Nah, here's what I think. I think that the reason everyone talks about older people not being able to memorize is that we start worrying about it. The fact that they say it, then we start saying, am I going to remember this? Will I remember this? Oh, I hope I don't forget. And, of course, that's the opening for forgetting. Huh. You could do it at 20, and you could do it at 60, and it can happen. Once the fear comes in, you know, then that's when you forget it. But if you just go in and say, I know what this is, and I know what I'm saying, and it just comes out. Look at Christopher Plummer. He's about 90 years old. He's doing long plays on Broadway still. All right, but then at the same time, uh, my friend Dave, who, who produces and hosts this radio program of the air, he remembers seeing Don Amici in uh, a production of Our Town on Broadway, uh, I guess about a decade and a half, two decades ago. And Amici was into his senior years, and unfortunately, to some extent, senior moments, because he couldn't remember a word. Oh, that, that, that is so... I mean, yeah. if that happened to me, I'd just say, 
no, no, I've done enough. Let me do go to the beach and enjoy that, uh, you know, because that's horrible to have had such a wonderful career and, and to, you know, end that way, that's terrible. It was, it was, and now maybe, said, Let's not do it. maybe a week or two after uh, he was in the role, if he stayed for a while, maybe at that, maybe it was just under rehearsed. Uh, but maybe not. Well, that's right. You, you, you know, you have to, you have to do your homework. I mean, whether you're eighty or sixty or twenty-one, you've got to do the homework. Now, you you spoke about not letting fear or worry creep into things, but let's talk a little bit about fear. As someone who's been on Broadway and musicals, do you get stage fright? Not just from memorization, but that general backstage butterfly thing. And if so, how do you cope? No, you know what I get. I get heightened excitement. Ooh. I won't say it's the ordinary thing that I'm just mostly calm, but I'm not frightened. It's, I, I feel it's different. The only time I felt sort of fear was when, and it's the only time I ever replaced anyone uh, on Broadway. Well, actually, I did it another time, but let's talk about this one. Um, Sweet Charity, uh, Sharon K. Ritchie, who had been a Miss America, and she was playing Ursula. And I was in a Broadway show called The Right Honorable Gentleman, which was an English drama. And at the same time, they had uh, my agent called me and wanted me to audition for this role, which she, she was, it, it was a, a lovely non-singing role in a musical, which usually isn't very good, but this was very nice. And, uh, but I was still busy in this play, so I never even auditioned. And I, my show closed. The, the Right Honorable Gentleman, I'm quite sure on January 29th, and I think, I'm pretty sure that Charity opened on the same date or certainly around there. Within, oh God, I don't know, it was three, four, five weeks, I got a call from my agent. They're looking for a replacement, and Sharon left. And um, so I got in. Well, anyway, because yeah. I didn't rehearse with anyone, I met Gwen. Ten minutes before we were to go on, and I came out, and there was we were in the palace. I'd never worked in such a large theater. I mean, the Broadway theater, which I did Gypsy in, was big, but the palace is bigger. And I must say, that's the only, only time my knees were shaking. Wow. I could feel my knees shaking, and uh, but just that first night, and but I was able to you know, it doesn't paralyze me or anything. Now, I've heard very nice things about Gwen Verdon. Was she was she great backstage? Was she a nice... Oh, fabulous, fabulous. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful lady. It was really great to work with. And um, we just enjoyed her so much. Everyone did. I think because she was a dancer. She started in the chorus. She understood, you know, that whole thing. And it, it was just a delight to be with her. Yep. And also, um, interestingly enough, you made fast and long-term friends with another actress who was in Sweet Charity at the time. You just hang off with Ruth Buzzy. Was there a particular... Yes, Ruth Buzzy. Yeah. Oh, God, we had such fun. We had such fun. And we both were in, um, in just uh, one act, you know. So we both liked sewing, and we, um, we bought... Not we, we didn't buy, we hired, uh, rented a sewing machine. And we would make clothes and all kinds of things. And uh, we'd often show it to Gwen because she loved clothes and she loved things that were cut on the bias. And so did I. And I used to make clothes like that. And um, so at one point, it was after a year, and the, one of the dresses, I wore two. I had two costumes. One was really worn out and it was really looking crummy, and, which was not good for this wonderful Hollywood starlet. Yeah. So Gwen told them, we need a new dress. Go out and shop with her. They weren't going to remake it. It was Irene Sharoff, wonderful, great designer. And we went out, and all they were looking at were really inexpensive, cheap, I will say, dresses. And so that night, Gwen said to me, so did you find a dress? I said, no. And I told her the kind of stuff we were looking at. She said, well, why don't you make your own? And I said, Oh, that would be fun. She said, yeah, we'll pay for the materials. We'll, we'll uh, get the wardrobe mistress to help you if you come into any uh, problems, and we'll pay you $100. And I said, oh, okay. I want $100. I don't want any money. She, and so I went to the stage manager and told him 
that. And he said, listen, Gwen is a major stockholder. She wants you to have $100. Take $100. <laughs> okay. And my best delight of that is that when they br- brought the production, not with all of us, but I mean a new production in London, and they copied the costumes. They didn't copy the original Irene Sharif. They copied mine. So that was a great, great fun for me. That's a, that's a real compliment, by the way. We're talking to Marie Wallace, who was in Sweet Charity, as we said, for a while. You were also in, I mean, and this is, this is uh, the original Gypsy. And you weren't a replacement cast member. You were there from the beginning. I was there from the beginning. But, you know, I, I, right now, I'm in an American Renaissance Theater Company production. And that is so wonderful. And it's especially I wanted to tell you about it because sure. it's only on for two weeks. And um, it's called Winter Works 2018, Look Me in the Eyes. And it's, it's very interesting. It has nine actors, six playwrights, and a poet. And so we have six plays, small, short plays, sure. mm-hmm. all but with the same theme of coupling, of, and all different kinds of couples, a man and a woman who have been married for years, two women who have been friends forever, and strangers in the park, and that's my play. And it's called New York Encounter, which right away I was interested in yeah. because New York. Native New Yorker, right. and I like, and it takes place in Central Park, which is my favorite place of all places, mm. and I'm having such a good time. It was written by Fran Hanman, who is a wonderful writer, and she also wrote the song that the entire ensemble does at the end, and uh, my little play was directed by Elowin Castle, and she's she's a marvel. She's directing. I think she directed three or four of the plays. So it's it's a wonderful and it's a very intimate setting, shall I say? And it's good because it is about intimate things. Mm-hmm. And I, I think uh, you know that uh, people are really enjoying it, and I know they'll continue to. I wish you were in New York. You could you'd come and be my bad guest. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> that was for you. Hello, don't tell my wife. Come and, come and be your bed. Let's, oh. But first of all, well, well, actually, let's get to that, too. A, we'll remind people that they can see you in the one-act play, A New York Encounter, as part of that Look Me in the Eyes uh, festival at American Renaissance Theater. It's happening through February 4th, 2018, so you do have until then to see it at the Director's Company over on 43rd Street and 8th avenue but you know speaking of hey hey you know kind of sexy in the costumes and and stuff like that or you you started as a model for a while i did i did and i always considered i never like was in love with modeling but what i liked about it i felt that it was my um, subsidy for off broadway because you know you made no money i mean you make nah. it's not like you do it for nothing but it's almost for nothing and but that's okay but you need to pay the rent and you need to eat. So modeling was a great thing for me uh, because, uh, you know, I, I remember my first show before The Great Gypsy was off-Broadway and it was Sophocles Electra and Terence Radigan's Harlequinade. And I think we were paid uh, all of $35. It's more than I make right now. I'll take it. <laughs> you want to try being a rabbi? It's more than a lot of us make it at, at any one week, but um, sometimes you make a little more, you know. Right. Anyway. Uh, Do you have any memories of, of uh, Harlequinade and Electra? Well, the best part for me was that I was just starting out. I was very young. I was studying with Jack Manning, studying Shakespeare, and I had already just signed up, you know, to enroll at NYU, and I was studying economics, and it was only a couple of months into it that my Jack Manning, the teacher, called me, because I had no agent or anything yet. I was probably about 17, and I'd just gotten out of high school, and um, he said, go over to the Rita Allen Theater and tell them I sent you, and you'll go and audition for Sophocles, Electra, and Harlequinade. So I did. I said, I'm Marie Wallace, and Jack Manning sent me. 
they let me in, and um, I got to read. And um, who do I find out is directing it? But uh, Philip Burton. Philip Burton was a great Shakespearean scholar and director, and he was the one who actually they called him the uncle of um, Philip uh, of um, what's his name Burton Richard Burton. Oh. In fact, he took his name from him, and he taught him. Oh, that wonderful voice that Burton had. Oh my God! And uh, so I was very thrilled to be in my first show, not being an apprentice and just doing, you know, junk work around the theater, but actually being in the Greek chorus and then having a nice part in uh, Harlequinade. And Philip told us because some people said. I don't understand why you're doing mm -hmm. a Greek tragedy with this little light comedy. And he said, that's the way the Greeks did it. They always had a little comedy and the tragedy. And I think yep. that that was even carried into modern times when they do Greek show. I think it was Peter Brook or somebody like that. They do this really heavy, you know, Sophoclean tragedy. And then in the last ten minutes, there'd be thing where they're dancing around a giant penis. They bring a <laughs> phallus. No, for real, for real. They yeah. they bring on a dick oh, and they dance around it and, and sing and make noise and joyful things. That's what they Wonderful. would do. Wonderful. Yeah, I know. I love it. And that's, that's what I do after my sermons on Saturday, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's an interesting shul we have. We're talking with Marie Wallace here in the neighborhood. Now, now you you skirted it away. You you we were gonna talk about Gypsy, but then you talked about the one act play, which I understand. But I'm not letting but you go. What I'm doing now, and uh, no, Gypsy was a great experience because again, I'd done that um, little off Broadway play, and it was wonderful. But um, now I my eyes were set on Broadway, and of course. Uh, an agent called me and sent me for it and uh, f to be in the chorus again from the Greek chorus to the gypsy chorus and um, my agent said wear leotards and tights I said okay I had no idea what that was so I wore a bathing suit <laughs> and I, I got there and we all got on stage and uh, it's sort of like chorus line you know first they look at you just by the way you look and they eliminate this one and that one, and then finally we all that were picked to stay were said were, were told, do the showgirl walk. Well, I had no idea what the showgirl walk was, so I just got behind one of the big tall girls, and I watched what she did. She put her arms out, and she took these long strides, and she was very sexy, and I just kept doing what she did, and we both were hired. So that was my entree into Gypsy Broadway. Now, do you have any recollections of working with Julie Stein and then Sondheim? And... Yes. Oh, sure. Not so much uh, Sondheim. I didn't really get to talk to him, but did talk a lot with Julie Stein. And I remember once he said he wrote this for Ethel, but he wrote it as if he was writing for a trumpet. Ooh. Isn't that interesting? And it makes sense, because also, here, here's the other deal. Like, we're talking about, I guess it was 1959, 1960, right, when Gypsy uh, yes. was happening. And now you go to a musical in the theater, and everything's blasting at you, and there's 25 amplifiers, and people have microphones crawling all over their bodies. Back then, you know, Ethel Merman was known as somebody who could stand on a, pay, uh, on a stage and ping her voice to the back row and everybody could hear her over all the orchestra, over all the brass. A, absolutely. is that absolutely true? And B, since there was no miking back then, didn't you all have to do that? Wait, yes, you were taught to really project. I hate when I go to the theater. And first of all, the whole sound of, of, of you know, loudspeakers and everything is just so horrible to me. And I can't, cannot, cannot, cannot stand those little mics through their hair or coming out of their ears. And, and the first time I saw it, really, I, I thought this guy had a big mole on his <laughs> cheek. And then I saw everybody having these. And I thought, what in the world is that? And I don't know what kind of voices they have, but to have to have a mic for 
every, and now they mic straight shows. Little off-Broadway oh, yeah. shows, I, I see, Mike. They do. They do, because they get the TV actors. And the TV actors, they talk like this, and they're used to not moving their lips. No. And it no. picks up, you yeah, know. Every, every yeah. TV actor worked like that, talked like that, except Dark Shadows. <laughs> because we were bigger than life. Well, since you met... Well, no, I want to spend a little more time on Gypsy. Do you have any... Okay, okay. Do you have any stories about La Merm? Um, well... Let's see... She was, you know, I wouldn't say she was friendly the way uh, Gwen was friendly or Robert Preston, who really knew you, knew the stagehands, knew their wives and all that. So Ethel would say, hello, girls, you know, wave to us, but never Marie or anyone else. And uh, in fact, I do remember something on Christmas, our... um, stage manager made an announcement and said, um, everybody in the chorus, come on downstairs in front of Miss Merman's dressing room. So we all piled down there and we're standing on line and he had a uh, list of everyone's names. Of course, he knew our names anyway. And as we went in, say Barbara London, he, he would say, Barbara London, and she'd say, Merry Christmas, Barbara, and shove this package in her, oh. well, not her face, her arm. Right, okay, yeah. And and we all thought, oh, okay, we're getting a big bottle of champagne, because that was about the size of it. And then, you know, Marie Wallace, oh, Merry Christmas, Marie, and, you know, hands that. We, so we all went running upstairs to the sixth floor, I think it was, and in the Broadway theater and opened it and the funniest thing is it was cologne Uh. and her husband was the manufacturer of this cologne (laughs) and it was cologne in a huge decanter. Uh. I have to tell you that it was sold at the Woolworths five and dime. Oh man. (laughs) And it was her husband's manufacturer. She probably didn't have to pay anything for it. Oh. Exactly. Oh, oh, well, well. Well, but, but at least she thought of giving us something. Yeah, no, I, she didn't have to give you anything. That's, that's, you know. Oh, absolutely not. But the best, well, I have a, a lovely silver plate, a little one, from Gwen Verdon at the year, uh, you know. No, it was at Christmas time. It says Christmas, Gwen and Bobby, 1965, on the back. And I love those kind of presents because you have it forever. That's a cherished thing. And, that, and that's a thing that, uh, you know, you maybe give to Broadway Cares Equity Fights Aids to auction off at the next. You know, when you're ready, when, when it's no longer your... Do, do, do you have kids? No, no. Oh. I, uh, by choice, I, I married and I, I just wanted a career and I didn't think the two could mix. And uh, so I, I didn't. Do you have a mix of regret and no, that's exactly right? Or... Oh, no, I have no regrets. No regrets. Uh, it, it worked well for me. My husband was a doctor, and... Um, oh, no wonder you could be in show business. There you go. Right? And uh, I wanted to be around with him. In fact, I didn't go on the road except for those short um, tryouts, because we, you know, as you know, we would have the tryouts. They don't do that anymore. Yeah. They do previews in town, but we always went to Boston, to New Haven, to Philadelphia, and we tried our shows out there. So we didn't mind that because that was three weeks. Well, the longest one was um, uh, Gypsy. I think we did six weeks and then extended it for one more week. But it was wonderful because it gave you a, a freedom. Uh, even It gave the... Um, um, the the creators. The writers, but, the yeah. creators, a chance to try different things. And those critics were very sharp. So they could listen to those critics and, and use that. And yet it wasn't right in Manhattan, you know? And I don't like, once they started previous, it's cheaper for them, no question. And today it would be so expensive probably to keep picking those things up. The only way they go now is the, you know, the the tours after they've opened on Broadway. Right, or or they might try something out in a regional institutional theater uh, and then uh, open there and then bring something in if it's a hit regionally. Yeah. Yes, 
they do that, and that's nice. I think that's a good idea, but not usually a musical, but but a straight play. Mm. Uh, I loved working in regional theater that way because you'd work with very good writers, and um, they would be there through the entire uh, time. And in regional theater, usually it was nine weeks. Paid, I mean, you rehearsed for almost four weeks, which is really nice, and then did a few previews right there, mm-hmm. four weeks. And, you know, you could talk, I worked with Jack Gilhooley, I worked with uh, Noonan, you know, uh, and... Um, Noonan being, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't think of his first name for some reason. Um, John? Baba Baba Noonan. <laughs> Now, did you do Winter and Listen Summer? The Lions, yeah. it was called. Okay. And uh, it, was, it was really, um, you know, a wonderful experience because it was, again, in an intimate setting, and yet you didn't have the pressure of New York. Mm. You well, were just there, and yeah. all you had to do was work on the play. It was none of the, your personal life wasn't involved, <laughs> nothing was involved. I did Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf up in Albany. Ooh, yeah. I mean, that was al- that had already been done. I don't mean they did it as a first tryout. Right. But, um, you were Martha? It used to be in a regional theater and not have to worry about, um, uh, you know, the, all the little petty things that happen in your life in the daytime. All you could do was eat, sleep, and drink, and uh, eat, and um, <laughs> have a massage, and think about... Virginia Woolf, because that's major. That's By the way, did, in, in that production, were you Martha, and then who was George? George was, uh, you know, it's interesting. No name. Uh, he was a professor from somewhere out Midwest that uh, the Albany Theater, Capital Rep it's called, mm. uh, would bring him in almost every year, I understand. He was a wonderful actor, and but not professional. I mean, he could have been, but he never went that way. He lived out there and taught, and came in for, you know, one show a year. And uh, so he, he was very good, very good. Now, speaking of better than very good, we're talking with Marie Wallace, the actress. You can go see her in the one-act play New York Encounter that is happening at the Director's Company on West 43rd Street over on 8th Avenue. It's happening from now through February 4th. And now, to find out... Oh, you know what we didn't say? How you can get the tickets. Oh, now now let's see if you can get this, because it's a little complicated. What is the website where people can get tickets for your show? It's called brownpapertickets.com. There you go. Brownpapertickets.com. And the name of the actual, because your one act is called New York Encounter, but the whole thing is what? That's right. It's, it's winter. The whole thing is called Winter Works 2018, Look Me in the Eyes. But if a person, let's say, forgets that... All, when when you get to brownpapertickets.com, it says find an event, and you can put Winterworks 2018, and up will pop it. But if you just happen to forget that, and you put in Marie Wallace, it'll also pop up. Oh, oh that's good. That's good. Well, that's nice. They, they they put a lot of different you know names and words in so that uh, somebody might remember somebody else, and uh, you know you can get get it that way. Now, you can also find Marie Wallace on Facebook at a page that is, and this is a long one, here it goes, Marie Wallace Dark Shadows Fan Club. So it's, you know, facebook.com forward slash Marie Wallace Dark Shadows Fan Club because um, a lot of people, they don't know from the theater, they never saw her in Gypsy, but they know Marie Wallace from doing Dark Shadows on TV. Now, how did you get that gig? I got that gig in 1968, and again, I was up at the Hampton Playhouse, and I remember my agent called me, not my agent, my husband called me and said, your agent called and said, did he was calling to see if you would like to be submitted for Dark Shadows, and he said, my husband said, and I said, yes, I said, okay, what's Dark Shadows? Now, it had already been on for two years, it started in 66, but I had no idea. I mean, I never watched television except to watch myself or my friends, and so, anyway, when I came back, I, I checked it out, and oh, that looked interesting, and um, got the audition, and went to it, and after the real audition, you know, 
the acting part and coming back and reading something else and all that. That night, I got a call saying I had a call back the following day, and uh, they wanted they were going to put us in costumes. The, the three people that were chosen that they were now going to make their final choice from, and um, so I went in. They did my makeup, and they gave me a beautiful gown. They gave and the others were a brunette, a blonde, and me, the redhead. Uh-huh. And the only thing I noticed, because I said, oh, gosh, this is vampires and ghosts and things. And these two gals had wonderful, long, straight hair, just like vampire, you know. But I didn't. I had, I had, I had longish hair mm-hmm. and nice, thick, curly um, hair. But I thought, you know, I can't compete with them that way. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to tease my hair out like mad, and it's going to look like a lion's mane. And that's how I acted when I got in front of the camera, because that's all they were looking for was the physical, because they would say to you, walk forward, now walk walk away, look over your shoulder, give us a come hither look and stuff like that. And so I waited, I sort of in the corner, kept teasing my hair and watching what they were doing with the other gals. And when they finished... I was called, and I did all my little walking and vamping and lion's mane and stuff. And this may be apocryphal, I don't know, but I have been told that Dan Curtis, who was the producer and originator of of this whole Dark Shadows, he was standing there watching it, and he threw his script up in the air and said, that's it, hire her. Whoa. How I got my first job on Dark Shadows. Now, and, and the thing about Dark Shadows is it was almost more like a repertory company because Jonathan Fred, he was there in one character for the whole time, but you were three different people. That's right. That's right. And that was what was such fun about it, you know, when um, uh, the director said to me on our last day, don't worry, Marie, you're, you, I know you're being killed off today, but you're going to be back. This is like a repertory company. Wow. And sure enough, and your favorite months later, after doing a play somewhere, came back and they had another part for me, and that was Crazy Jenny Collins. That was a good one. And because she was crazy, <laughs> because you could yeah, really... I think yeah. so. Because fairly recently, I I watched some of those episodes, and uh, I called my agent and said, "Find me a crazy part. They are such fun to play." <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. I've lived a crazy part all my life, let me tell you. Speaking of television, by the way, yeah. um, I don't know what this is connected to. I took this note down, but I don't know why I took the note down. But you worked at some point with Jackie Gleason? Oh, I did, yes. I did Sly Fox with him, with him and Cleavon Little and Erwin Corey. Oh. And um, Arthur Penn directed it again. You know, he's the original director. And we treated it just like it was a beginning new show. Because you see, the original idea when they wrote it, Larry Gelbart sent it to Jackie. Oh. To do it. But Jackie said, I just sent it right back because I don't know if you remember or remember the stories. No. Jackie and David Merrick had big fights when he was in, I think, a show called Take Me Along on Broadway, yeah. fights, where it was in the, uh, I don't mean this fights, but, you know. Well, no, but everybody hated David Merrick, so okay, yeah. yeah. So I didn't hate him, and I'll tell you why later. Ooh, okay. um, uh, anyway, um, so he said, I'll never do a Broadway play again. And, mm. you know, he didn't have to. He was the king of television and the honeymooners and, you know, living down there in Florida. And, uh, but he said at one of the first rehearsals when we talked about it, he said, I made the mistake of opening the script, and I couldn't turn it down. Uh, so but they here's decided this... we would do a yeah. long tour across the country, then go for the opening season of the theater down in Florida, wherever it was that he lived. And after that, four weeks there, come up to New York and open that. Unfortunately, in Chicago, he had to have triple bypass oh. surgery. Oh. So that ended that. Because I thought... The, the up one... to that point, yeah. we, we, were tra- you know, we went to Sam, 
San Diego, um, San Francisco. We, we went all over, and uh, it, it, yeah, he was wonderful. Oh, good, because we talked, we, we opened the conversation about memorizing lines, and the thing about him, at least in The Honeymooners, was he had a new script every week, and half the time he'd be fumble, or he'd put his hands on his hips if he didn't remember a line. Was he fine in Sly Fox? I know, but you, this is unbelievable. What? Day one, he knew the entire script. Mm. Day one. Oh, boy. And by now, he was an older man. I mean, it wasn't old and ancient, you know. Right, right. But I think we did that in um, uh, 79, something like that. Well, I, I guess also at that point he could memorize one script and do it over and over and over as opposed to having to memorize a script in three days yeah. and do it on TV you know, live. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Except, except mm -hmm. that um, usually it's hard to learn just at home without working with the actors and everything. Ah. But he learned it by rote. I mean, he knew everything. Wow. Oh, this is a fun story. Ooh, tell me. You know, because we were t touring all over, we had a lot of opening nights. And so we had an opening night in, um, where did Joe DiMaggio have his um, uh, restaurant? In is San, San Diego or San Francisco? I've forgotten. I think it's San Francisco. And anyway, so he came to the party, and as did Jack Haley and all those. And Jackie liked me a lot, and uh, so he we we got along well. And I remember him calling uh, for his wife. I've forgotten her name. And he said, "Come here, come over here." I just told him that uh, this dame is the only one I can depend upon on on the stage. Isn't that right? Isn't that what I told you? And she said, yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, he said to Joe DiMaggio, you see this dame? She is to the theater what you used to be to baseball. Whoa. But to marry her. What? Whoa. Yeah. That's a... <laughs> I love that. That's... Not that I was interested because I had a boyfriend and we would speak to each other every night <laughs> from there to New York. But, but it, I just thought that was a, a fun Kind of. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, nobody doesn't want to hear a line like that. That's beautiful. Right, that's, right. that's wonderful. Exactly. Now, speaking of wonderful people of the theater, you mentioned in passing Robert Preston, but we have to talk a bit about him because uh, oh, yes. everybody loves Robert Preston. Everybody loves him, and there's good reason. He is the most wonderful man, and um, uh, he. I was in a play with him called the, uh, No, um, Nobody Loves an Albatross. Yes, in 1963. Yeah. Mm, right. And um, he was so great. Now, I remember when, when I came to the second audition, he was there. Very often the star has final approval over the director. And um, so, uh, so I knew he was there. And then I got the part. And then I guess about a week later, we were starting rehearsals. And the rehearsal hall... You don't rehearse on the stage, you know, you rehearse in the studio. And there was a big staircase, and I started going up, and who's coming up at the same time but press. And he looked at me and he said, welcome aboard. Uh. And it was just, it was such a wonderful way to start a play, you know, with someone just, and in fact, when we had the lunch break, Connie Ford was in it, and uh, Connie and I, and it turned out Preston and two other people, I've forgotten who, all went to lunch together. And I had, I went with them, but after about 20 minutes or a half hour, I said, I have to leave because I had to run over to my agent. I hadn't signed my contract yet. And he called me and said, you got, you got to get over here. You're supposed to sign before you start rehearsing. So I left and I handed, you know, quietly Constance Ford, $20 towards my lunch. So when I got back, Connie handed me the $20. And I said, well, but, 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 but that was for my lunch. She said, I know, but Press took all of us out to lunch. Whoa. I and mean, didn't he... You know, not, not too many people do that. No, not only, and he also made, um, I, I think, at some point a speech to you all, like on the first day or second day of rehearsal. And, oh, and... yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Gene Sachs was the director, also a wonderful actor, if you remember. And um, 
so he was just telling all of us actors of what he was going to do and etc and he was really directing it all to us and then um press spoke up he said excuse me i just want to say something i'm part of the company i'm not the star i'm not I'm just all one of you. We're all one. And again, that was another thing that made us all just relax. Mm. And we were fine. Oh, that, that, I just love hearing stories about that. I almost dread then asking about one other person uh, that you were in a show with. You were in a, a play I by... I can't imagine who you mean. Well, no, no, I'm not saying it's going to be a terrible story, but in uh, a play by S.J. Perlman called The Beauty Part, which... Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, um... <laughs> Charlotte Ray, our friend of the neighborhood, that uh, she was in that show. Larry Hagman, Alice Ghostly. That's Alice Ghostly, David Doyle. Oh, I mean, what a cast! And and the star though was Bert Lahr, who had Lahr. he had he had his personal difficulties. Did he did he bring them to bear on everybody else, or did he just torture <laughs> himself? You know, he, he um. I thought when I worked with him that maybe all comics were like this. He was so morose. And he had, it seemed to me, such little confidence in himself. And so, I mean, when we were in New Haven, we got on the elevator together. And he said to the, um, oh, the uh, elevator operator said to him, I saw the show last night, Mr. Lar. He said, yeah, what'd you think of it? What'd you think of it? <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and so then when we were up in, I believe it was Boston. We had a luncheon with a bunch of women, and uh, afterwards they were going to be coming to the show with some sort of theater party. And so I remember this very lovely woman said to him, Oh, Mr. Law, all of Boston loves you. And he said, Yeah, then where are they? They're not coming to the show. Mm. You know, so, so, he wasn't nasty to people. He just felt like constantly beleaguered, like his career was going to crest and fall. He, he, he did you read the, the biography by his kid by by uh, no, John Lahr? No, I Lahr? didn't read it. But I, I do remember that um, he, he uh, when we were at Thanksgiving. You know, when you're an actor and you're away for a big holiday, the actors, the company becomes your family. Well, they become that way anyway, but I mean, especially in the holiday. So we couldn't cook a turkey or anything, but we all went over to Casey's restaurant and all had our Thanksgiving dinner or luncheon together. And we look over and there's Bert with his son and they're hardly talking to each other. Mm. They didn't seem to have any kind of communication. It was so uncomfortable to see it, you know? And uh, he just, he, he was a complex character, I guess. Now, is he, are there, are there any people that you worked with, and maybe they're dead now, that you would never work with again if they were still alive? Well, you know. Come on. Somebody, wait a minute. Once Robert Preston said this, he said, very, you know, meaning it as a joke, of course, I'll never work with David Merrick again until he asked me. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you know? Wait, but you said you had a nice, you, you had no problem with David Merrick, you personally. No, and you know what I, why? It was just a little thing. Um, we were, you know, in the chorus, right? We were the big showgirls, and uh, there was a number, and it's never been in since that first original show. There was seven more of us in, besides the dancers, the little tiny dancers. So the big, tall showgirls were in this last number and it was a christmas tree number and um one, one night i don't know if it was um whose thought it was to cut that number out and uh so we were walking down the alley and we had to sign in we had to come in and sign in and then we were dismissed they said you don't need to stay tonight you're not doing your number so we were walking up the alley towards our hotel and david merrick sees us and he said, what are you girls doing out here? Why aren't you in the theater? And we told them the story. They're cutting it. He said, no, they're not cutting that number. Ooh. And he went back, and sure enough, we were in it until the end of that run. <sighs> That's the only reason I say I have a nice feeling about it, you know? All right. I mean, you didn't do it for your sake, per se. No, 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 
absolutely not. <laughs> uh, he probably didn't know what my name was compared to Carol Joe and Barbara and Theda, you know. Well, by the way, we know... So did it, and uh, so we were very happy. I mean, being, you know, your first show on Broadway, it's a big deal. Oh, every show on Broadway is a every big deal. Every show is a big deal, but it's funny because I remember when I said, oh, if only I could just get one little walk-on or a chorus, I'd be happy, that'd be it. And as soon as you get that, then you say, well, this is great, but if <laughs> only I could get a nice small part. Right. And then you get a small part, and you say, well, it'd be nice if I had a really good part. You know, it's just... It, it uh, it's really the way human you. nature. You you create you you get a taste of it, and yeah. it's like you, know, you get hooked, and you want to be a, a one person eight hour show in the Palace Theater is ultimately <laughs> what you right. want. That's right. <laughs> Playing fifteen times a week, you know, eight hundred dollars a ticket, and you're and you're set. It's good. Uh, right. Well, this has been worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Talking to Marie. Wallace, I'm going to remind you one more time before we ask her one last question, but uh, Marie Wallace is in the one-act play, A New York Encounter. It is part of Winter Festival at the... Winter Works 2018. Winter Works 2018. Look me in the eyes. I never understood that phrase. What am I going to look you in the elbows? Look, <laughs> look me in the eyes. Well, we could try. I mean, it'd be a little odd, but the American Renaissance Theater Company is doing it. It's at the Director's Company Theater at 311 West 43rd Street. That's um, around 8th Avenue, and it's running through February 4th. So you want to check that out? They get their tickets through brownpapertickets.com. Brownpapertickets.com. And, of course, if you want to find out more about Marie Wallace, go to her Facebook page, Marie Wallace Dark Shadows Fan Club. Could it be any longer? Marie Wallace Dark Shadows Fan Club on Facebook. And, by the way, uh, people can, um, you can send people, that, and this is really cool, a copy of your autobiography that you wrote a few years back, yes? I do that, too, because I also have, oh, uh, that if, if they're interested in my book, I do have a Facebook page called On Stage and In Shadows, and that's the name of my book. On Stage and In Shadows? Yes, and, and it, the, the, right on that page, it tells you exactly how to get it, and it's a great deal as compared to just getting it through, um, you know, Barnes & Noble or something, which is fine, but it's just the book. And on this situation, you get an 8 by 10 of me, a page with uh, Dark Shadows pictures, and a personal letter besides the uh, autographed book. And what is it, like 20-something? Uh, it's, it's $25. 25 yeah. bucks for a book and autograph a thing? Come on, how can you beat that, for gosh sakes? <laughs> That's right. And all these stories and more told by Marie Wallace. So, Marie, how long do you think you will continue to act and do what you do? Well... Time will tell. I don't know. As long as something is good and funny and interesting, then I'll do it. If it's not, I, I don't want to go on the road anymore. I'm not interested in that. I want to stay in New York. I mean, I don't necessarily want to stay in New York, period. I like traveling and all that. But I don't want to go on a show traveling. It's, um, it's not the greatest, you know, conditions. When you're young, it's great and fun and right. wonderful. But... Um, um, no, but if something comes up in New York and I like it, I have to like it now. I, I don't do it just to keep busy. I don't need to keep busy. I have other wonderful things to do to keep busy. Well, actually, uh, so, then, let's I, make that our last question. What do you do to keep busy um, other at other times? Do you, do you still knit like you learned backstage at uh, charity? Uh, so? No, I... Um, I used to paint backstage mm. and but you know the I don't paint now but I'm probably going to be taking it up again but I did something that's very similar I had a kind of second profession uh, of, of photography and I worked for uh, about the last 10 years as a photographer a special events photographer oh lovely and, yeah and I, then I did my own of course my own work and um and have had a couple of shows and won some, you know, awards for, for, for it. And uh, so that's been a, a very big part of my, my life. 
and I just like to be in Central Park. I like to um, read. I like to do whatever comes up. Well, I'm thrilled that this program came up and that we have had Marie Wallace here with us in the neighborhood. Please go see her in Look Me in the Eyes and, and her one-act play that she's in, New York Encounter. And also keep apprised of everything that she is doing because, as we've seen, she is delightful. Marie Wallace, we thank you for being with us in the neighborhood and shalom to you. And shalom to you, Rabbi. I had a wonderful time talking with you. It's been great, and I look forward to doing it again. Halavai. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye.